So um, defamiliarized bodies, uh, and we will talk about the concept of the grotesque and how this might relate to defamiliarization. Um, and as I said, we will probably go on and talk a little bit more about this next time as well. So starting off by thinking about the etymology of the grotesque, um, if we go back to the 15th or 16th century, um, we see uh, a description here, wildly formed of irregular proportions, boldly odd. Um, and you can see it comes from French um, and also from Italian grotesco, meaning a cave or a grotto. Um, and the way this is explained is that the, the word was first used uh, of paintings found on the walls of Roman ruins. Um, and uh, it was we, now we have this understanding of the grotesque as something uh, disgusting or repulsive, but it wasn't originally meant that way. It acquired a pejorative sense after the mid 18th century. Before then, it was just understood as fantastic in some way. So it, it, it included an element of fantasy. So there's something about grotesque, even if you look at the word, there's something about it which is fascinating, even if it's fascinating in its repulsiveness or uh, even if it elicits feelings of disgust. We know that uh, films, for example, horror films, um, may include elements of the grotesque, and there is something, not for everyone, but for some people, there is something fascinating about this. So we'll talk about grotesque, especially in uh, relation to bodies and how this is... Uh, an example of making strange. So, um, grotesque style is, um, we could call it fantastical, absurd, incongruous, exaggerated, um, often linked to the body and its more base organs and functions, copulation and excretion, orifices and protuberances all the bits of the body that it's uncomfortable to talk about. That is historically what the grotesque relates to. So what I will do is I will talk you through some various uh, phases, we could say historically, um, phases that the grotesque has gone through and um, different um, areas that it relates to. So if we think about it in a visual sense, it's often, uh, distorted representations of the human body or parts of animals conjoined with human forms. Um, and it's linked to transformation or metamorphosis. So going back to um, the origins or one of the main origins of um, the theory or the thinking of the grotesque in Western literature, um, we have Rabelais and this uh, long, uh, I think there are five volumes of this text called Gargantua and Pantagruel, which is about two giants. I think P Pantagruel is the son of Gargantua. And you can see one of the illustrations there, um, which is um, of Gargantua, who is this huge giant, and it's a lot, and who is really big, and it's a lot, and you can see the size of the people around him. Um, so it's about, and he, he's eating, and he's always eating. So food is very much, food and ingestion is very much a part of this. Uh, and it's it's a comedy. That's another thing to say about it. It's um, funny, um, lots of base humor, um, this isn't um, high brow literature, it's um, lots of jokes about arses and sex and overeating and just really um, silly, deliberately so. 
so where were we? Gar Gargantua and Pantagruel. Yeah, okay. So, um, and then uh, this old text was somehow re, uh, revivified by a Russian writer called Mikhail Bakhtin. Um, he wrote this text in the 60s um, called Rabelais and His World. And he wrote all about both um, two concepts which are related, the carnivalesque and the grotesque. So he writes about um, carnival. So this is, so we were talking earlier about liminality. I think carnival, um, the carnivalesque could also be presented as a liminal uh, space or a liminal state. Um, I'll read this for you from Bakhtin. He says, Carnival is not a spectacle seen by the people. They live in it and everyone participates because its very idea embraces all the people. While carnival lasts, there is no other life outside it. During carnival time, life is subject only to its laws. That is the laws of its own freedom. It has a universal spirit. It is a special condition of the entire world, of the world's revival and renewal in which all take part. Such is the essence of carnival, vividly felt by all its participants. The tradition of the Saturnalias remained unbroken and alive in the medieval carnival, which expressed this universal renewal and was vividly felt as an escape from the usual official way of life. So this kind of festival, carnival, celebratory atmosphere where the normal way of life with all of its hierarchies, all of its different social ranks, all of its normal rituals of work um, and the, the general order of time um, was suspended at the time of carnival. And then carnival is, Bakhtin is theorizing this and saying that it's a time of uh, transformation and metamorphosis where um, reality is somehow suspended. So everything associated with a carnival, costumes, masks, clowns, gestures, music, um, intoxication, alcohol, um, hedonism, uh, people misbehaving, all of those things um, feed into this concept of the grotesque. So this is a, a useful um, bit of uh, context. Then what he says of the grotesque, um, he says, to degrade also means to concern oneself with the lower stratum of the body, the life of the belly and the reproductive organs. It therefore relates to acts of defecation and copulation, conception, pregnancy and birth. Degradation digs a bodily grave for a new birth. It has not only a destructive negative aspect, but also a regenerating one. Grotesque realism knows no other level. It is the fruitful earth and the womb. It is always conceiving. So you can see how he is presenting this in both, um, it's not just a, a negative concept. It's not just a positive concept. It's both. Um, but the important thing is that it's grounded in the body and not just the body, but things that enter and leave the body. So food enters the body, substances enter the body, um, and what leaves the body, other substances, um, and also um, giving birth. So that's the regeneration aspect of the grotesque. Okay. Um, so he's also, this is a little bit more um, on the grotesque from Bakhtin. He says, the grotesque body is not separated from the rest of the world. It is not a closed, completed unit. It is unfinished, outgrows itself, transgresses its own limits. The stress is laid on the, those parts of the body that are open to the outside world. That is, the parts through the world enters the body or emerges from it, or through which the body itself goes out to meet the world. This means that the emphasis is on the apertures or convexities, or on various ramifications and offshoots, the open mouth, the genital organs, the breasts, the phallus, the pot belly, the nose. 
the body discloses its essence as a principle of growth which exceeds its own limits only in copulation, pregnancy, childbirth, the throes of death, eating, drinking or defecation. This is the ever unfinished, ever creating body, the link in the chain of genetic development, or more correctly speaking, two limit, two links shown at the point where they enter into each other. This especially strikes the eye in archaic grotesque. So you can see um, everything that we about the body that we might find embarrassing to talk about, shameful, rude. Um, related to defecation or sex, um, are parts of the body where the outside world comes in or bit from the things from the body go out, these are the grotesque elements. Things that stick out from the body or thing or kind of convex things that kind of go in. So protuberances or orifices. So these are the grotesque elements. And if those, if these elements on a body are somehow augmented, stretched, enlarged, this, the effect is grotesque. So that's um, some more detail. He also says the essence of the grotesque is precisely to present a contradictory and double-faced fullness of life. Negation and destruction, death of the old, are included as an essential phase, inseparable from affirmation, from the birth of something new and better. The very material bodily lower stratum of the grotesque image, food, wine, the genital force, the organs of the body, bear a deeply positive character. This principle is victorious, for the final result is always abundance, increase. Okay, so um, this is Bakhtine, probably the most famous um, theorizer of the grotesque um, and the carnivalesque in this text. It's been theorized in other ways since then. Um, one of the ways that it is theorized is because it, in some ways, the things which um, it are talked about here to do with the body some theorists have talked about this from a feminist perspective um, in specifically about the female body and what it might mean, the female grotesque. Um, so uh, this is a little bit more um, recent, or this is from the 90s, from a book called The Female Grotesque. Mary Russo says the grotesque body is the open, protruding, extended, secreting body, the body of becoming process and change. The grotesque body is opposed to the classical body, which is monumental, static, closed and sleek, corresponding to the aspirations of bourgeois individualism. The grotesque body is connected to the rest of the world. So Mary Russo is showing how some elements of the grotesque body and all of the different uh, factors and features which Bakhtin outlines, they are some, sometimes read as the more um, stereotypically female aspects or feminine aspects uh, of the body. So that's one way it can be read. And we'll come back to that a bit later. So um, historically, we could look at this in various uh, stages. Um, the medieval or uh, Renaissance grotesque um, just as Bakhtin had described, uh, relate to secular festivals um, such as the Saturnalia, comedy and laughter, the figure of the Harlequin or the jester or the clown, and this concept of the carnivalesque. And then if we kind of zoom forward to the 20th century um, and modern uh, art, writing, um, visual art, we might think about a modern a more modern grotesque, which is more related, to, I would say, to surrealism, which is about the unconscious, about dreams, um, and then a somehow incongruous um, arrangement of body parts in a different way. So it's still the same uh, selection of the rude body parts that we find embarrassing to talk about, um, but they're organized somehow differently because it's this relation to the unconscious. 
And then if we think about the grotesque now, I'll show you some images uh, in a minute, which for me, this is one example of how we might think about the contemporary grotesque. Um, you yourself might think of different examples. We can talk about this later. Um, I'd be interested to know your thoughts. So my suggestion about the images I will now show you in the contemporary grotesque, there might be a closer link to hedonism and to overindulgence, sex, vomit. Um, and the example I'll show you is um, stag, well, we call them in the UK stag and hen parties. Um, and I, I can ask, you can tell me later um, in different uh in different cultures, in different countries, how you call this. So the parties that um, a man or a woman has traditionally before they get married um, and all of the misbehavior that goes on at these um, kind of celebrations. So those are, the, those are some tentatively suggested historical stages of the grotesque. And what I would say is all of them are linked to the body and in terms of the body, they're, they're linked to insides and outsides, genitality and orality, ingestion and excretion, orifices and protuberances, strange proportions, and also intoxication, celebration. We could add liminality to this as well, um, and metamorphosis. So those are all the aspects to look out for in this um, area. So I think now I will show you some images that pertain to these uh, different stages. Some of these might be familiar to you. So starting with Leonardo da Vinci, um, five grotesque heads. So think to yourself, um, to what degree do these images um, relate to the descriptions we just heard? Uh, so Leonardo da Vinci, um, this Quentin Massis, the ugly, ugly duchess. Um, and Archimboldo, the green grocer. And I will come back to the Archimboldo uh, example later on. And then we've come right uh, up to the 20th century with a surrealist example from Max Ernst. So whilst in these previous examples, we had um, heads, uh, mainly heads, um, quite hu recognizably human, whether they are ugly or not, human heads. Um, and this one is like an inventory of the parts that make up a human head, but made up of other um, objects. So vegetables. Um, this is an interesting example of a kind of metamorphosis, but the way that these parts of the uh, face are kind of blown up, it creates a grotesque effect. Really clever. Uh, but then when we get to Max Ernst, we have a different kind of image with um, uh, a figure, a human figure with the head of a bird, whether it's a, an actual head of a bird or a mask, we're not sure, but being unsure is the state we are somehow intended to be in surrealist imagery. Um, and we have um, quite a violent image there. Um, another uh, violent connotation here with the title of this from Magritte, which is called Rape, quite a, dis some would say disturbing image. Um, some of the things I show you in this lecture are, could be seen as a bit disturbing. So this is a little a mini content warning. Um, so you have the body parts somehow presented in a way that is wrong. Um, so you could say that the result of this is also grotesque. Coming forward again to the um, early 2000s, Jenny Savile's uh, paintings are often, her artwork in general is often described as grotesque in different ways because um, again, we have a human face, um, but the coloring um, is indicative of um, injury, maybe violent injury, uh, we're not sure. 
um, going forward again. Okay, so this is this is my suggestion of the contemporary grotesque. And the, there are a few photos I'll show you from um, a book of photography um, from Dougie Wallace, um, which is, and the book is called Stags, Hens and Bunnies, A Blackpool Story. Blackpool is my hometown in the north of England. So this is why I'm uh, particularly interested in this. I mean, it's only my thinking that this is, uh, we could think about this as the contemporary grotesque. Um, but if you think back to the lists that I just talked about in terms of body parts, in terms of ingestion, in terms of excretion, in terms of sex, um, also in terms of the, another thing which I didn't mention is that, um, often the kind of playing around with gender presentation, which is, this is also part of this carnivalesque as well. Um, so that's one, there's another one, a very classic uh, image of someone being sick on the street, uh, which you see very often in um, Blackpool. Blackpool is famous for these stag and hen parties, which I mentioned. Um, there's a possibly explicit image um from another of these parties i think that's it oh yeah one more so um someone's been uh, taped to a lamppost um and then we have this bride to be um clutching a large inflatable penis so all of those aspects of these body parts and um strange proportions hedonism um all of those things are present in these images so I'd be interested to know if you are thinking of other ways we could think about the contemporary grotesque. We can talk about that um, later on. Okay, so we've looked at images. What does um, grotesque writing look like? So I just, um, I put there a very small extract from, going back to the first example I mentioned, Gargantua and Pantagruel from Rabelais. Um, this is a description of a character Shrovetide. I'll read it for you. His toes were like a virginal on an organ. The peritoneum or call wherein his bowels were wrapped like a billiard table, his nails like a gimlet, his feet like a guitar, his back like an overgrown rack, his heels like a club, the soles of his feet like a crucible, the vertebrae or the joints of his backbone like a bagpipe, his legs like a hawk's lure, his ribs like a spinning wheel, his knees like a joint stool, his brisket like a canopy, his thighs like a steel cap, his shoulder blades like a mortar, his hips like a wimble, his belly as big as a tun, his paps like a hornpipe, his armpits like a checker, his shoulders like a hand barrow, his navel like a symbol, his arms like a riding hood, his groin like a minced pie, his member like a slipper, his purse like an oil cruet, his genitals like a joiner's planer, their erecting muscles like a racket, his loins like a butter pot, his beard like a lantern, his chin like a mushroom. So you can see how this example is ridiculous. It is also surreal. It's uh, a long time before surrealism happened, but it's surreal in that the um, we have an inventory of body parts and the way that they are um, compared to objects seems utterly random. Um, and but the effect of imagining all of these together is is definitely grotesque. Um, even the mentioning of each body part is somehow grotesque. In grotesque descriptions, you often get this list effect, an inventorial effect, um, where body parts are even named. Even the naming of body parts begins to take on a grotesque effect without much effort, I would say. Um, we'll see more inventorial uh, examples in a minute. So that's one example. Um, Coming to much more uh, closer to our time, uh, Kathy Acker, I'm a fan of Kathy Acker, she's a really interesting writer, she was a really interesting writer, um, this is in one of her texts, Blood and Guts in High School, she says, 
Writers create what they do out of their own frightful agony and blood with mushed up guts and horrible mixed up insides. The more they are in touch with their insides, the better they create. So this is a direct link from the, the things that we might write to our very internal organs. So there are many examples of, write, of <laughs> bits of writing from Kathy Acker, which we could call grotesque or examples I could show you. Um, so uh, here's another one. So this is the same text, Blood and Guts in High School. Um, and you can see another inventory um, this is, it somehow goes into the style of a play. It's an extremely inventive text from her and quite shocking in, in lots of ways. I'll read it for you. The capitalists lie down and make love to each other. That is the only sex we know nowadays. Mr. Blowjob, our love is here to stay. He and the others in ecstasy take off their false cocks and lipsticks and diamonds and kneecaps and fake fingernails and pacemakers and artificial kidneys and breast sponges and contact lenses and American Express cards and lying voices. Lies, lies, lies. Mr. Fuckface, you see, we own the language. Language must be used clearly and precisely to reveal our universe. Now, this is a really interesting example in various ways, because it's um, something satirical. There's satire going on in Acker's writing a lot of the time. She's satirizing the relationship between sex and money, sex and capitalism a lot of the time um, in funny uh, and grotesque ways. Um, and the, uh, the, the way that that list of um, fake elements relating to the body, um, almost like pros pros uh, kind of prosthetics, uh, and this is, a, again, something I'll talk about later on, the, the concept of the prosthetic, um, this kind of fakeness, um, the listing of this in, in relation to body parts is also quite grotesque false cocks and lipsticks and diamonds and kneecaps and fake fingernails and pacemakers and artificial kidneys, etc. cetera. Um, so this is a more uh, modernized version of the grotesque. Um, moving to another writer who's really good at grotesque descriptions, Angela Carter. So she writes a story um, which somehow uses the figure of Alice from Alice in Wonderland but translates it to a different context, to Prague, which is the, um, the city, which is the origin of the concept of uh, the golem, which we will get to, another arguably grotesque figure. This description, which she has in this story, if you listen to this and think about the Archimboldo um, image, I think this is a relation to uh, somehow a kind of a reference to the Archimboldo. So I will just flick back to the Archimboldo. Um, see this um, and then listen to the description from Carter. The size and prominence of the secondary sexual characteristics indicate that this creature is like the child of the feminine gender. She lives in the fruit bowl. Her hair is largely composed of green muscat grapes. Her nose a pear, eyes filbert nuts, cheeks russet apples, somewhat wrinkled, never mind. But now what devastation, hair mashed, nose squashed, bosom pureed, belly juiced. So it's a, it's a, a version or a defamiliarization of the concept of the human form composed of, um, in the Archimboldo uh, painting, it's vegetables. Here, it's fruit. Um, and the, the, the character, or it's not really a character, it's just a figure, fe a female figure made up of fruits. She's in the story, she's called Summer. Um, and in this description, the fruit is, is all squished up and old and, um, not good, which uh, increases the grotesque effect, I would say. Um, and yeah, so that's an interesting example from Angela Carter. 
Okay, moving on. Um, and these are, so the, the next examples, um, I uh, will come back to these uh, next week um, because the concept of the grotesque body is something which was, um, which is mostly not anymore, thankfully, but certainly in the past was commodified um, and by entrepreneurs and marketed and presented to audiences as side circus side shows and freak shows. Um, this is an, this is a side circus a picture of a circus side show um, from the uh, early 20th century. It, the, the date says 1933 um, in America. So it was Barnum and Bailey's combined circus side show. Um, and this is from a book um, from a, a, a disability theorist um, called Rosemary Garland Thompson, Thompson. And she described it here saying, the freak show stage brought together peoples whose bodies could signify the enormous, the miniature, the exotic, the excessive, the lacking, the profuse, the indeterminate or the alien to produce a motley chorus line of physical difference that made the onlookers bodies seem ordinary and banal by comparison. So you can see from that image, um, the, the probably the most striking uh, thing that you notice initially is the, um, the difference in size between these people. Um, and there is, and, and a lot of the things which would have been um, marketed and commodified then, now it's taboo to us um, to kind of point and look at, at physical differences. Um, and because, and rightly so. Um, so the, this is in the past and an interesting question is how to think about this now, how to affirm this in different ways. Um, and it has been affirmed in different ways. Uh, there, in a way, um, so affirmative gestures, um, crip theory is an area of cultural theory, um, which affirms these, so it takes the way that different bodies, defamiliarized bodies, or extraordinary bodies, as that title goes, um, they would have been ostracized or alienated, um, treated badly in the past. Now, the people um, themselves who may have these kinds of bodies, different bodies, differently abled bodies, are speaking out themselves and producing art, performance, writing, and theory all of these things. Sometimes it's linked with feminist theory, sometimes it's linked with queer theory, and all of these uh, areas, um, they produce this affirmative gesture. And it's interesting in the, in the example of crypt theory because it's using, um, sometimes using this concept of grotesqueness in different ways. Um, so those are some examples of texts um, from this area that might be interesting interesting to look at so uh moving on um to the concept of the homunculus which i uh promised i would talk about um so there are various um ways we can talk about the homunculus um we can talk about the cortical homunculus and we can talk about the alchemical homunculus, because this word means literally little man. Maybe it makes sense to talk about the alchemical homunculus first. So it's linked to the figure of the golem, which is also a, a little, a, miniature, a man in miniature or a person in miniature. Um, it's always described as a man in, in historically, and there has been work done more recently to talk about this, the homunculus as a, as a female. Um, and I can give you references if you're interested, but um, originally um, it was thought by some uh, alchemi alchemists or alchemical thinkers in Renaissance times that by brewing up the, the right uh, ingredients, you could produce a little man in a glass jar like these images show. 
Um, so uh, that's the alchemical homunculus. Um, but the cortical homunculus is something different. Um, as I might have described to you at the very introduction to this uh, seminar, the cortical homunculus is a figure, is a human figure with, with um, I would say, defamiliarized proportions because the size of the parts of the body don't correspond to physical the physical proportions, but they correspond to the density of um, neurons, uh, kind of the motor neurons, sensory um, cort cortical sensory um, density in the skin. So where you um, so your hands are very sensitive. So in this image, the hands are huge. The tongue. Um, and the lips also lots and lots of sensory receptors. Uh, so they are also huge. Now that, it, that um, there are so many different um, theories about this, uh, which I think we will go into next time. Um, it's been argued and debated. And for example, that uh, these two um, images, they, I'm not saying they are so called correct or not. I think there are different ways we can interpret it. But as an example of a body with, a, with alternative or defamiliarized proportions, it's really interesting. So um, we will come back to that. Um, and yeah, there's lots to discuss here. So I, I look forward to um, hearing your thoughts.